Welcome to the Paths to Understanding podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be sharing wisdom from our neighborhood with Rabbi Danny Weiner of Temple to Hearst Sinai. I'm so happy to have him with us. Uh, the mission of uh, Paths to Understanding is bridging bias and building unity through multi-faith peacemaking. As we begin all, all these podcasts, we want to acknowledge that all of us, at least who are helping to be a part of this podcast, are currently on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. We honor with gratitude the land and, and the Coast Salish peoples themselves, and, uh, and we're grateful uh, to them. Uh, today, we, I have with me Rabbi Danny Weiner from Temple to Hearst Sinai. He believes passionately in building Judaism for the 21st century and in healing the world through social justice. He's the senior rabbi at the temple in Seattle, and he worked with other clergy on contributing to the founding of the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility he has served on numerous boards, including various committees of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, chaired local rabbinic boards, and on multiple national boards of Jewish congregations. His rabbinate places a special emphasis on interfaith and ecumenical efforts, working closely with the Episcopal and Catholic dioceses, and creating bonds of partnership and faith with local African American churches. His columns have appeared in the Seattle Times, the Forward, Ha Aretz, Wiener wrote, Good God, uh, Faith for the Rest of Us, about the dangerous polarization between fanatical faith and soulless secularism. So, Danny, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor and a pleasure as always, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. So, Danny, um, I, I just am curious about, you know, you, you serve a, a temple that has two locations. You've got a lot of staff and a lot of people. Um, how is your community temple to Hirsch uh, handling the pandemic and and what has changed about your work on a daily basis and how you, you serve and, and lead uh, the people of your community? No, thank you. Uh, listen, I think in so many ways, uh, what's going on within the congregation is a microcosm of what's going on more broadly in our society as we all, I mean, I hate to use these trite words, but I have no other way to express it. You know, how we're all getting accustomed to the new normal, how we are, uh, seeking to uh, exert some patience and discipline and resilience to kind of get through this moment. And now particularly looking at the, the light at the end of the tunnel, seeing it's not an incoming oncoming train, but rather a vaccine that hopefully, if uh, allocated and distributed widely and well, um, will help us to get back to some semblance of our pre-COVID experience. So I think Kind of, we're struggling with some of the things that everybody is struggling with in the wider culture. Very specifically, pretty early on, almost immediately when we locked down here last March, it's hard to believe it's almost been a year. Um, you know, we transferred everything that we do online essentially into the virtual space, and we had had some foundation for doing so through um, through streaming and some technological uh, mechanisms that were already in place. But it was, you know, really both um, programmatically, culturally, spiritually and technologically, it was a very quick kind of pivot to this new reality. And, um, you know, we weren't sure what was going to happen, what was going to happen in terms would people accept it, would they connect, uh, even at, at a time in which, ironically, there was such a, a, a visceral need to connect with other people physically, our inability to do so. And the fact that it now was being done in the virtual space, we didn't know if that was going to, to fly. Would people uh, uh, kind of resign their membership for, for an, any number of years? Would people stay connected? Um, and we have been incredibly, incredibly gratified with not only the response of people who, who are responding, I wouldn't say with their feet because we don't really walk around anymore that much, but are responding with their eyes, I guess, um, yeah. to our ongoing classes and education and worship experiences, even social justice experiences. And we have been very, very fortunate that our congregation has recognized the value of, of what we offer to them and to the wider community, have recognized the unique challenges of this COVID period and have been incredibly supportive at a time of great uncertainty and, and great, um, great uh, tumult. And so, um, you know, I, we are very much looking forward to the time in which we can safely 
be back out in the community. And we are actually in our congregation, and I think this is reflective of most Reformed Jewish congregations. We are erring, if I don't think we're erring, but if we were considered to be erring, we are erring on the side of caution in terms of not having in-person events uh, at, the, at the synagogue currently. Um, I've done some, a few weddings when the weather was nice outside in people's yards with, uh, with just a handful of folks. And I've done a number of socially distanced uh, graveside funerals. But other than that, everything has been everything has been online. And even with the Zoom fatigue and p- pandemic fatigue that we're all feeling, um, no. I- I've been very gratified with, uh, with the ability to maintain a sense of community and connection in these cre- incredibly challenging times. Yeah, man, I, I, I've been, I've thought of you many times this last year, and as well as a lot of other, you know, larger congregations, and and and, it, and sometimes even the smaller congregations struggle more because they haven't had all the technology, or you know, they just didn't have any of it. Um, I I talked to a friend of mine who was having a, a a real emotional reaction after a Zoom worship service just went down, and I had to say to him, "Look, man, think of all the thousands of things, millions of things that have to go right for any one of these to work well." I mean, you know, Babe Ruth had a batting average. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not always going to work. You know. Um, yeah, listen, you remember from, from from baseball, if you're if you're hitting three of ten, you're doing you're a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it's so difficult. You know, this, this has been such a difficult year on so many levels because what we typically do when there's a major challenge to a nation, to a community, to the world is we come together. And, in you know, part of the thing for Paths to Understanding has been how do we get people together when we can't get people together? You know, it's just it's just a big challenge. And and I, I, I think it's it, as so I think, you know, and then I've had another person say to me, Danny, um, well, I bet you just can't, you know, can't wait until the government lets your churches, you know, get back together again. And I just said, look, I don't think any of us uh, want to want to uh, not fully embody our values of caring about each other and our neighbors in such a way that we put them at risk. Like, so I, is that a mistake or is that really thinking about how our core values actually have to be lived out in this unique situation? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the kind of narrow frustrations that that many of us have is the way in which, amongst everything in our society these days, um, religion in general, and specifically pushing to have in-person experiences, and that being a reflection of patriotism or First Amendment rights, rather than just an embrace of our core values of wanting to care for people and erring on the side of caution. I mean, that's been really frustrating. Um, one of the things that I'm being in touch with the governor's office is, you know, they very desperately want, especially high profile religious leaders to model good behavior and to model caution and to model uh, patience. And unfortunately, not all of our colleagues, um, lesser here, more in states like Texas and Florida, not all of our colleagues are are really living up to that uh, to that standard. I mean, do they, you know, you know, so I, I mean, for, if I were a pastor of a congregation right now, I mean, I, I would not want to be known as the congregation that put people's lives at risk. Just or that, w- that was a happen. super spreader, which is happening. Legit- I'm, I'm hearing from even rabbis all over the country there, you know, they tried to do something with a few people and it ended up being a, a spreading event. I mean, you, you can't help it when you're in close proximity. We want to talk. <laughs> we, we want to sing and yeah. God forbid, maybe even hug. And that, you know, we just can't do that right now. So, so in the midst of all the, the, this other, this pandemic, you know, we've got, you know, obviously a chronic loneliness happening and uh, which was of course a major element in our society before. And, and uh, you know, the, the whole K-shaped economy, you know, so some people, I mean, I'm doing very well, you know, but, Lots of people are, but there's another 50% of the population that is, has gotten incredibly under economic stress during this period. What, what are you doing at the temple to kind of meet some of the needs of people in your communities? Yeah, I mean, as I said previously, there's this painful irony of, you know, this is the time in which um, when there is some kind of national, international crisis, communal crisis, People come together, and it's one of the strengths of religious community. And the uh, the painful irony is that um, we're we're unable to do that. I mean, I think one of the things that we're doing is exploring ways in which um, the virtual experience 
um, even though prior to COVID it always kind of uh, appeared as or seemed to be a pale secondary substitute, how this is becoming um, something almost on par with the in-person experience as as a way for people to connect. And I think one of the legacies of COVID afterward is that all of our experiences moving forward are going to be hybrid experiences. We are going to have to up all of us, those who want to be viable and really be responsive and reach our communities, we're going to have to up our tech quotient, our tech capability, even when we are able to be together again. Um, but one of the ways that we're, we're also doing this is really imploring with uh, amongst um, not just our staff, but our lay folks, um, ongoing outreach, particularly to those who are most vulnerable, older folks who even in the best of times are more isolated than they should be and are particularly isolated now, just reaching out by phone, by Zoom, what have you, um, to all of the, to those folks in particular, and then more widely to the congregation on a number of different occasions throughout the year, just letting people know that uh, even though we can't be together in person, that we're thinking about them institutionally and personally and reaching out to those in need and also trying just through kind of informal uh, when we know it formally, but also the informal kind of congregational grapevine, people who are maybe even in more more desperate need, either because of mental health issues, because of economic issues, and trying to target and reach out to those folks and to be as responsive we can in the uh, in the midst of the severity of of kind of the full spectrum of need that this crisis has engendered. So how are you all trying to do like social, like, like meets, you know, social justice needs or, or um, like hunger needs in, in the larger community around you? Like, I know that that that's even that's hard, harder during this COVID time too. Um, how have you been trying to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do is essentially ramp up some of our existing pathways for, you know, social justice, whether that's advocacy, or education or kind of direct service. And obviously it's much more difficult to do some of the um, um, food bank, homeless shelter kind of stuff that we did before, but we're trying to support those organizations that that are supportive of, of, those, uh, of those populations and those who are able to, to do some things. I mean, we, we continue to work specifically within the Jewish community. Um, we have kind of centralized social service organizations like Jewish Family Service that is kind of the, the united way of the Jewish community, kind of in some ways, the repository of efforts and resources directed not just to the Jewish community, but to the broader community. So continuing within the, uh, uh, the guardrails of COVID safety, you know, working through organizations that have been really successful and impactful and trying again, within COVID prescriptions to, uh, to meet the needs and in some ways the more intensive needs of those um, who need food, who need uh, technological support. There are so many folks. I mean, we know that there's one of the great um, relatively un unacknowledged uh, tragedies of this period is what's going on in the education realm. And that, uh, what did I see a recent, uh, a recent statistic that half the kids in the Seattle public school system are kind of MIA, uh, you know, for the year. And some of that is just you know, kind of the intensity of the experience. Some of it is based on just lacking the technological means of connecting. And so one of the ways that we've been uh, focusing some of our efforts is, is finding out what communities need extra technological help and trying to direct our resources toward, toward those folks, particularly kids, so that they can, um, as, as, uh, as, as difficult as, as a full day on Zoom is for, for a lot of these young people, for all of these young people, some of them just don't even have the means to connect at all and trying to remedy that. Yeah, that's and that, you know, is is right at you know, really exposes the the wealth and income inequality that is an opportunity uh, inequities that is so much a part of our current situation in the United States uh, and was before COVID. You know, Danny, I, I, um, I I've been thinking about, you know, uh, the meeting that that you helped to call at Temple de Hirsch in 2017, soon after the Muslim ban was was proposed. And, and of course, you have the picture over my shoulder here is of uh, Father Tracy and uh, Rabbi Raphael Levine from Temple de Hirsch Sinai, of Temple de Hirsch Sinai. And um, I always have their, their picture over my shoulder now when I do these, um, just to, to remember the legacy that we're standing on of that, that desire to stand with others. And I, I think about uh, Rabbi Levine, 
who initiated through his vision the challenge program uh, and Camp Brotherhood and a lot of other work that happened and Father Tracy who who was invited to come alongside and who really grew in that relationship and I, I think about the Protestant pastors too who were willing to use what was for them um, they're willing to use some of their their greater societal sort of privilege or reputation and lend it to this effort of interfaith you know, conversation and respect and. But I remember being there, like it was yesterday, sitting next to Aaron Meyer, who I miss uh, as well. And we had a lot of interfaith leaders from around the state there. And we were trying to you know, work to counter some of the dehumanization that, that, that seemed to be coming, not seemed to be, that was coming uh, out, of, out of the Trump administration and the White House at the time. And we all like were pretty busy doing work the last three or four years. And I, I, I'm kind of wondering, like, what impact do you think our efforts had uh, to counter some of that dehumanization from your vantage point? Like, how would you look back at kind of what we tried to do, and was it effective at all? What what could, what did we what did we learn from from the last now, few years? Yeah, and I know I remember that, and I've so appreciated your involvement with that. And that really was just part of a series of ongoing gatherings of uh, some of the usual suspects uh, from the various faith institutions in town, specifically to respond to what was emerging in those early days of the last administration. And I know that we put together kind of a covenant statement that uh, that we shared with our communities and used as kind of a an inspiration and a blueprint to, to move forward. But I think what that did was um, twofold. One is more generally it um, focused the faith community to be part of the larger galvanized effort of resistance to what we saw as on, on, on the largest level, kind of just an anti-American, uh, anti-American uh, agenda, an anti-American program, specifically targeting the most vulnerable and immig immigrants and et cetera. Um, what I think it also did is something that's kind of my ongoing hope, and that is particularly here in Seattle, where there are many folks who are spiritual but not religious, whatever that means. Maybe that's fodder for another podcast. But I think it, it, uh, I'm always seeking in this community in particular to demonstrate the ways in which um, faith leadership and the values that undergird those faith communities speak powerfully and relevantly and responsively and impactfully to the issues of the day that even though our tradition is rooted in values that go back millennia, that they speak as powerfully and prophetically and um, purposefully today um, as they did thousands of years ago and God willing will thousands of years from now. So one of my key hobby horses as a, uh, a fairly plural, as a pluralistic and a fairly modern uh, religious, religious leader is to demonstrate the ways in which this this timeless wisdom truly speaks to the issues that matter to people today. Oh, sorry, my dog's coming in here. Uh, truly matter to to people. That's the the risks of Zoom Zoom experience. Um, uh, truly matter to what people are care about today, and the ways in which some of the, the ways in which people often aren't fully aware or acknowledge that the values and principles that matter to them didn't come from nowhere, <laughs> that these right. came from these time honored tenets of faith. And even if people are feeling uh, um, ambivalent about their faith or their sense of God in their lives, that one of the great legacies of faith traditions are the ways in which these values have integrated and permeated kind of the larger cultural consciousness. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of people, you know, in the in these like 300 or so events I've done around the state and around the country uh, to counter anti-Muslim bigotry, you know, which which you know, I I, I saw as a um, I, I saw I felt the need to respond to it because there was so much money behind it. Um, and a lot, you know, because if you if you if you can make 1.8 billion people on the planet a danger, you can sell a lot of weapons. Right, uh, and people were making money off of that, and so you, you're kind of ginning up that hate. And I, and but the reason that I that I saw that as a as a challenge or noticed it specifically was that um, my tradition, the Lutheran Christian tradition, made horrific mistakes in the 1930s and 40s in Germany, 
and those horrific oh, mistakes. Sorry. It's sorry okay. about that. Those horrific mistakes. <laughs> it's all right. It, I have a dog too, so it's all good. So <laughs> those horrific mistakes, you know, um, led led to the events in the Holocaust and the murder of of our Jewish neighbors, and so and and the Roma and people of who had uh, physical or, or mental challenges or disabilities, and and, and many more. And um, and so part of being in, in a tradition is not only having values and stories and tradition and, and you know, like like you know practices but part of being in a tradition is recognizing when people in your tradition have made mistakes why they made them when they made them and then learning from that so that you can act differently next time so we're in a, in a way responsible at least to learn from those mistakes and so when people ask me you know, why are you doing this you know my first quick response is well because of jesus but my my deeper Good answer. response is, <laughs> exactly, and, and my, my, but, but but the more fulsome response, you know, is is that as as an American, I recognize how far short of our aspirational constitutional values we've we've fallen on many occasions and historically over a long time. Number two, because as a Lutheran Christian, I recognize how often my community has cared more about its worship attendance, you know, than about its neighbor. And um, and lastly, that I've I've come to know and love uh, people in different wisdom traditions, and I've realized that I can't be a a complete human being without being in community with them, and that I love them. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so I think people like think of these these uh, these the, these traditions as sort of start, somehow sort of dead. But actually, they're, they're, they're a way for us to keep our collective memory alive and our own self-critique as a community alive to help us behave differently, which is the heart of the prophetic tradition. No, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the um, kind of errant thoughts that I believe people have is oftentimes when they think about the religious basis of our country, you know, despite uh, Jefferson and the wall or whatever, you know, the, the religious yeah. basis yeah. of this country, um, a lot of it, a lot of it in the religious basis, the basis of the enlightenment kind of uh, uh, ideological foundation of our country is in many ways rooted in in these religious traditions, not so much the tribal kind of narrow parochial elements of them, but certainly the whole notion of natural law, the whole whole notion of the rights of of human beings, I think, can be can be traced ironically because people often see religion and the enlightenment as 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 binaries. Um, can be traced to, um, you know, kind of uh, the, the dignity and the value of human life that religion has imbued in our kind of philosophical and theological understandings of what it is to be a human being. And so oftentimes people talk about the religious basis of this country, and oftentimes it's within the context of a narrow Christian understanding. But even a cursory view of, you know, the founders, the deistic sense, the notion that we all are kind of share a common creative basis for, for being, you know, I think I give credit to to religious traditions for um, for injecting that into a somewhat secular context. Right. I, I think a lot of times those conversations are used. I mean, I, I what I see in a lot of Christians, Danny, is uh, and um, and sometimes, you know, in my own community, Lutheran Episcopal community, is that we've defined salvation as being being part of an exclusive group that has that claims the status over and against other people and that kind of uh, that kind of um, notion of salvation is in direct contradiction to the abrahamic tradition as a whole and to the teachings of jesus that, that many christians claim to to follow who um was completely against in his term the kingdom of god against uh the the very notion of hierarchies of human worth and value right and so uh so a lot of times this conversation about the the, the religious tradition in, in in forming um our our democratic republic you know um get used in a tri in a tribalistic way to, to claim that that everyone should be like us when when in fact, um, 
both the Abrahamic tradition as a whole and Christianity specifically, I think, is very much against that kind of notion. Yet, I, I mean, we know this just from our current current moment. Um, there is that uh, enduring power of tribal exclusivity. Um, and that's, you know, it's been around for a long time and it waxes and wanes, but we, we are seeing the the uh, the uh, a bitter harvest of that right now in our current culture. We are. Yes, we are. And uh, and so, you know, on, on January 6th, you know, I don't know how how your experience of that day was, you know, but I I, I, I was very anxious uh, leading up to it about violence and that sort of thing. Uh, could never have believed that 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 those folk could have gotten into the into the Capitol building so easily. Um, so as a as sort of an event, um, how do you read those events about where we are in the United States at this moment? Um, can you give give folk a sense of how you think about the importance of that and what what's led up to that? Um, just anything that, that that you've been thinking about, Danny? Yeah, no, and I think it's going to go down as, you know, to, to borrow a phrase, a, a day that will live in infamy, um, akin to other kind of major tragic uh, um, altering events in, in, our, in, our national, in our national history and consciousness. Um, to me, it was, you know, kind of a, a, a double-edged um, um, experience. On the one hand, of course, just the incredible... I would say not surprised because anybody who had been paying attention a little bit to what was going on in the cultural foment would ferment, excuse me, would know that that's that's uh, this was inevitable, that it was maybe surprising it hadn't happened previously. Um, but um, shocked, but not surprised at what happened. And it really, as you said, perhaps the, the most surprising thing was the ease with which they were able to enter the Capitol the uh, profound lack of preparedness on the part of government institutions and security and the shock of um, uh, the shock of the fact that they were in some ways it was an inside job there were clearly uh, uh, security folks um, but also you know probably legislators who were uh, uh, fellow travelers with these insurrectionists and were supporting them logistically if not ideologically but the other side of that of, of the equation is um, that I'm grateful that America passed a stress test on its democracy. And I think in many ways, this was a smaller, but a culminating aspect of that. I think the whole Trump presidency was a stress test of our democracy. I think particularly the post-election uh, promulgation of the big lie, which we've seen in other cultural uh, historical contexts, but which is absolutely the way to describe it now. Um, that was a major stress test. And we, we came close to not doing well uh, with that stress test. But I think when, when push came to shove, particularly these last few months, we have seen the institutions and the majority of the most um, critical uh, uh, leaders uh, in our society have, um, have withstood those pressures. And so I am, I am grateful for that. Uh, in the same way that I am utterly shocked and overwhelmed by the, um, uh, the somewhat of the effectiveness of that insurrection, that insurrectionist move, which failed um, in, in terms of its short term goals, but probably succeeded in terms of the long term uh, encouragement of a, a growing number, a, a devastatingly growing number of folks in our our society who are susceptible to and how are vulnerable to that big lie well and that and that term big lie you know of course is is a is a term and i haven't read you know tons of books in in that whole um realm but i've, I've read quite a few articles now and listened to some podcasts of people who talk about that term big lie um as a way to uh, as a way that that authoritarian leaders use a falsehood that that generates a sense of fear on the basis of what what people love to then overturn democracy itself and install the authoritarian leader in perpetual leadership so it may look like a democracy but it actually isn't at all and it, and it is and i, I hitler, hitler was hitler was elected right i mean it's uh well, you that, know it's 
Yeah. And I hate to go, I hate to go, I, you know, uh, Godwin's, uh, you know, Godwin's law about not invoking Nazis because it kind of takes the conversation. But I mean, I, 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 that is the, you know, the most recent, uh, uh, if not extreme, uh, iteration of this is, and it goes back to just the whole, you know, it, it's not just the rise of Hitler, but even prior to that, it was, you know, the post-World War I milieu, where the big lie at that time was that, uh, you know, hey, we could have won, but our leaders sold us out, you know, combined with communist and Jewish industrialist or whatever. And that big lie, you know, sustained the, the entire rise of, of Nazism and sustained the, uh, the, the uh, initiation of World War II. And um, we are seeing a, a similar big lie now, but even more uh, disturbingly, it is augmented and is able to permeate more deeply into the heart of our culture and our consciousness through social media. That has really been a dynamic, um, uh, uh, exponentially growth inducing uh, 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 engine for for the promulgation of the big lie here now. Yeah, I mean, another person that I have historical figure that uh, that I've heard uh, Trump compared to has been Benito Mussolini. You know, because he he used all those same kind of pieces and the, the, this big shock event, you know, and this and this uh, the reports were getting that not only was the president in the White House watching with glee what was happening in the in the in the Capitol, but he was he was slowing down the, the response of of the National Guard uh, to the to the entire event and that other people in the administration were doing the same thing. Um, Boy, oh boy. Um, I, I, so I agree with you. Like, I think in a way it, it, it shows in, in what a fragile state our democracy is at the moment, right? And, and is an expression of that. And it was an attempt at a coup. I mean, it, it is an attempt at that, at, at the destruction of our democracy. At the same time, I am grateful that, that, um, that, that the flag was still there. You know the flag is still there, and not a Trump flag on top of the Capitol. I mean, I, 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 uh, and I get a little chill as I said that, just, just now. No, exactly. I mean, as shocking as it was, it also was affirming. Um, I, yeah. I wouldn't want to have to go through the extremity of that test again. I'm hoping that there, <clears throat> despite some some ongoing, you know, uh, large pockets of continued resistance. I'm hoping that we can learn the lessons of this history and further yeah. strengthen the institutions and the mores that uh, that hopefully will prevent that from reaching that level in the future. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and you, you've already talked about social media and we could certainly talk more about that. I, I mean, Danny, this last spring we were doing a social media campaign in preparation for, and we had a plan for like a year uh, with, with uh, you know, animated videos and stuff like that, because the research shows that anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish uh, language rises before elections. And thus, and thus, as you move to an election, you see in increased violence toward those groups, as well as, you know, black and brown skinned people and so on, and LGBTQ and, and on and on. And so we had this social media campaign. And, you know, what I learned from doing that campaign is that um, that hate, fear, grow at an exponentially greater rate in any kind of online social media environment than does respect. It's easier to generate fear and loathing and disgust than it is to create any kind of connection. And uh, I mean, we had we had people responding negatively to the fact that there's about a hundred thousand American Muslims serving as doctors in the country. And the comments were like, you know, really horrific. And so um, I, I, I think we can't underestimate the the power of that. But there are also other social forces as well. And what do you see as some of the other social forces uh, that are at work to undermine our sense of togetherness in, in our in our in our democracy? You know, that's a, <laughs> that's such a broad question. And unfortunately, I know. there's, there's I so know, many ways. Yeah, there's so many ways to go with that, obviously. Um, are. You know, um, one of the things that uh, I find it comforting to um, to to kind of rely upon and to, to revert to my study of history not only because it helps me to put 
current moments in a larger context and understand that these things are cyclical, that it's not a, uh, for better or for worse, that, uh, that the history of civilization is not a, 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 an unbroken traje trajectory, either upward or downward or what have you, that these things are cyclical. But also, and this applies to more, more broadly to other beleaguered minority groups, but, but in particular, um, Jewish history you know, teaches me that there's kind of a, there's a, um, a, a formula here, and that the formula is whenever there is great internal domestic strife and tension and or coupled with or as opposed to um, external threats to a nation that the the classic response is for um, people to uh, at, at least in terms of the Jewish experience is to uh, to increase their persecution of Jews um, and oftentimes it's the dynamic of the various power centers in a society. In feudal society, it was, you know, the nobility and the aristocracy versus the monarch and the king and whatever elements there are in our society today that are equivalent. What, what, what we're seeing today in terms of, as you were saying, um, a, a significant uptick in um, uh, uh, discrimination and and physical, if, if not uh, uh, online yeah. ideological attacks on on uh, uh, minority communities is kind of the classic response to um, what we're seeing in our society more broadly, which is, you know, whether it's globalization or technology or um, either the complete disenfranchisement of a whole swath of people in middle America, all of these things, you know, are maybe unique to our times, but the response in terms of a, 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 a focused uh, uh, need to seek and attack a scapegoat, scapegoat that's, that's classic throughout our history. And so what I'm also hoping is that there are perhaps some, le some remedies that we can also discern from history to, to apply to this, to this scenario. Yeah, I mean, I think Irvin Staub, um, among many others, uh, you know, there's a lot of work out there that, that I've really benefited from learning about like what is dangerous speech and, how, and dehumanization and how does it work? Because you know, most of the folk involved in the 262 million, uh, you know, genocide, you know, people lost in genocide in the last century, most of the people engaged in doing it weren't trying to do evil. They thought they were protecting what was good, right? Many of them, not all of them, but but many of them were convinced of that, that violence is necessary and and, and even laudable um, and, and morally right. What Irvin Staub says is that the, the key difference in societies that go down that path when they get to this anxiety, scapegoaty, dehumanization process, and those that don't, are that in the societies that don't, um, people who are part of the, 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 the major population group uh, of that country stand up and become active in standing up and standing for and standing with those oppressed minorities. And, and, that, and, and the earlier we do it in that process, the more fruitful it can be, the more minds it can change, the more hearts, people can say, hey, wait a minute, maybe that isn't us, maybe that isn't necessary. And that's, that's behind a lot of the work that I've tried to do, Danny, is how can I use my white male cisgender pastor collar with black shoes wearing privilege to create space Yes, but who, who's categorizing, right? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's okay if I say it about myself, you know. I was going to say, you know, you know, uh, Woody Allen's not uh, is no longer the best uh, the best source of uh, insight, but there's that great line in in Annie Hall where you know uh, he categorizes some woman, he, and she says, you know, it's wonderful to be reduced to a kind of a social stereotype or whatever. So, but you know, if we do it to ourselves, it's okay. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but, but but part of it is that there are people who will listen to me that won't listen to you. And so how can I how can I use, you know, my perceived uh, credibility with that group in the same way that the rabbi and Father Tracy and other other Protestant pastors used their credibility to speak into their own community in a way that made a difference, you know, and that's and that's what I think we need more people to do. So we we've seen the these hate speech and conspiracy theories, you know, arise. And we got people in Congress now who, who are, you know, full on, you know, QAnon supporters. And of course that, that those, those movements started a lot of times on 4chan 
which is essentially an unregulated, you know, hate hate site website. I mean, I know they do. There's other things that happen there, uh, but um, and we've seen them move through social media and into electoral politics. And one of the things that they that they hold in common, almost all of these groups are is anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-LGBTQIA, and other kinds of of racism. Um, what do you think that means for our nation? And, and how do we respond to that? <laughs> you know, um, conspiracy theories uh, in general and their content are, are nothing new. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, there are elements of QAnon that are, you know, just rehashed echoes of anti-Jewish blood libels from the, from the Middle Ages. The idea that, that a secret cabal is exploiting children and kill I mean ugh, all the terrible things so this is not new but unfortunately it's it's it, it it's a <laughs> an oldie but a goodie for those folks it's it, it remains effective which in some ways if you're more cynical is is uh, you know can get so can can um, induce someone to have less faith in humanity but um, I have I have more faith in humanity I, I you know this stuff happens again at these extreme moments of domestic unrest and um, perceived foreign threat. Um, you know, the, these things are, you know, as I said before, in terms of history are formulaically, you know, kind of uh, come to the fore. The big difference, the big difference is the social media element. And I'm not saying this as a Luddite and I'm blaming everything on social media, but um, putting aside the problems of Facebook and other groups that have not monitored this stuff, um, just the notion that people who have been isolated we imagine in their mother's basements, but these people who have been isolated and speaking maybe just to a couple folks in their neighborhood or their town, suddenly they are buoyed with this sense that they are part of a larger, part of a larger yeah. movement. Um, you know, listen, I think the key way, I think there are more good people and more right thinking people uh, than there are a minority, even though they tend to get a lot of airspace because they're covered by yeah. our media, because yeah. if it bleeds, it leads and you want to do whatever, all of those things. But I yeah, think yeah, yeah, there, yeah. Are more, there are more good people who need to constantly and continuously stand up, confront it as a big lie, um, work to change the mechanisms of social media so that they are, these things are not as um, uh, easily and as widely um, uh, uh, distributed uh, as they are now and shared as they are now. I mean, keeping in mind the need not to engage in censorship, but again, the First Amendment is not an absolute right. Incitement and, 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 and the promulgation of, 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 of lies and misinformation that is going to result in people dying and, 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 and violence, you know, that needs to be, that, that we need to have um, a constitutionally minded folks balance the costs and benefits and come up with a way of of of, yeah. of monitoring and regulating you know that those media but i think there are enough good people who are yeah. who have come together to to change the direction of this country and i think who will continue who will continue to do so it's not going to be easy it's not going to happen overnight we on the side of right and good uh need to need to be patient not not to not to um uh, be satisfied with an unjust status quo but by the same token realize um in the words of of our my rabbinic tradition that it's not ours to finish finish the task but neither are we free to desist from it it may be you know we have to keep our our, our shoulders to the to the millstone and keep pushing ahead but also not look at um uh the uh, the pace of this as as um, uh, discouraging, and so I think you know pushing ahead, continuing to push the envelope, continuing to concert good people of goodwill and their effort, opening up uh, conversations with people maybe that we wouldn't be in conversation with. Not all of the folks who voted for the last administration, by a long shot, are evil, horrible racists. Some of them are, but most of them aren't, and we have to speak not just to their concerns, but even more importantly, I think, to the root causes of their pain and their disillusionment that made them so susceptible to such a toxic message. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm going to go back to, you know, a really challenging. So first of all, over my other shoulder is a little blue uh, piece of paper back there on my counter, which which has the quote from the rabbi about 
we're, we're, we don't have to complete the task, but nor are we free to set it down. So that's that's sitting over there, right over my shoulder, um, also as a reminder to me. Right, because if we think we have to do it, we have to complete it. It actually leads us to a, a kind of a both either defeat or to use mechanisms and 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 strategies that themselves become what they oppose. Right. Um, when I think about about like Christian theology uh, about this, I, I mean, I think profoundly the the leaders of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all all of those together, YouTube with its algorithms that leads you to get focused on more and more and more of what you just focused on, right? So if you if you're looking up how to fix your 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 door, all of a sudden all you see are door videos, right? Um, that same thing happens for people who are dab who are in, in dabbling about hate, and, they, and pretty soon that's all they see. So I think that there's a fundamental um, naivete about human beings, and the way I like to think about and talk about what the Christian traditions, some of them teach about human sin, isn't that human beings are bad, but that we're vulnerable to certain kinds of pressures. And I think that human beings are very vulnerable to. Um, on the basis of what we love, being told that that, what, that which we love is threatened and that we have to act now to protect it. And then we begin to threaten the entire society and the peace of the nation, the peace of the, of the community, and to threaten our neighbors because our fear has taken hold. And I like to think about that, that, that teaching of sin that way. And I think, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, I think is completely not, at least appears uh, to be completely his at least his policy is completely naive to the impact of dangerous speech and how it tears apart human communities and prepares us for violence against each other and that there are and then once the violence starts one side starts to justify its violent behavior on the basis that somebody else you know did something on some other perceived side when in fact um, we all just got to calm down and realize that that most of us intend each other well Right. Yeah. And, and that focus, that focus on um, protecting something we love as kind of a, uh, you know, almost kind of singular, uh, you know, kind of myopic, uh, you know, uh, almost obsessive compulsion, you know, but it's rooted in um, hopelessness and cynicism and disillusionment. It's it, it becomes a, 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 a an all encompassing object of a certain group's uh, uh, worldview and actions that are based on that worldview because they feel that there's not, they have nothing to lose and there's nothing else going, uh, there's nothing else for them. If, if you, the future, your future and the future for your children and grandchildren is one of hopelessness, uh, disempowerment, disillusionment, cynicism, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to grasp for anything that gives life a sense of meaning and purpose. Right. And that's, that's that whole, you know, part of that whole bowling alone, uh, you know, sort of notion that we are so separated from each other. You know, we're, we're in bigger cities, we're completely surrounded by other human beings all the time, but we're, we're kind of encased in our automobile, <laughs> you know, or, or our apartment, you know, um, to, to add to that plug and he, to add to that plug and he should give us a cut of the profits, you know, Putnam's new book, <laughs> Putnam's new book, The Upswing, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to see it, is really oh. both uh, chilling, but also incredibly um, inspiring and incredibly hopeful, where he basically says, you know, we have moved from kind of the early, the early decades of the 20th, 20th century to this point now um, with an upswing in terms of uh, uh, a sense of communal consciousness and sacrificing for the greater good. And by the 1960s, ironically, it started to turn back to an extreme sense of individualism where we're at now. And his premise is just as we were able after the Gilded Age to go from, from individuality to communal consciousness and now back to individuality, that there can be an upswing now again. And I find that to be, you know, with his wonderful credibility rooted in his social science background and all of the incredible charts and surveys and every, everything that big data can give us in the best sense of the word, I find yeah, his yeah. Th this work to be really inspiring and empowering for, for where we can, we can take our current moment. Yeah, so, you know, I think as I think about um, my, the experience I've had with all of these engagements in 
current in congregations of various kinds in in community groups in larger scale public events um what i see is like the major religion and the word relig religio means that which holds us together the, the ligament that holds us together um a lot of, for a lot of people the primary religion of our time isn't judaism or christianity or islam or anything like that it's just that, that our identity is that we're producers and consumers uh, in, a, in a free market economy, winner take all free market, free market economy. And, and if that's people's meaning system, and it's all about me getting what I get, what, what I can get, and not about the system that supports and upholds everyone, then when the economy goes bad or when, when globalization happens and, and jobs are overseas, or as what's happening now, uh, with uh, automation and mechanization taking over a lot of jobs. And we only have 12 million manufacturing jobs in the country. And that's that's down from 16,000, like in around the year 2000 or whatever, uh, 1998. Um, and we got a lot more people in the country now than, than we did then. Um, when that happens, then people have not just lost a paycheck, they've lost their sense of meaning. And, and I their, and their identity. Just, their identity. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. The and whole male. Please. No, that was it. That was it. No, I was going to say the whole male provider identity of so many. I mean, the re, one of the key reasons why. And again, this is overblown, but I think it's still apt. Of course. You know, the whole kind of disenfranchised white male thing that everyone's talking about. But a lot of this is exactly what you're saying, that people have lost not just a job and a paycheck, and Biden actually talked about this in his own personal experience with his father yeah. growing up. You lose your identity. You lose your sense of, 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 of who you are. And when you're that unmoored, you're vulnerable and susceptible to things that you probably previously never thought you'd, you'd, uh, you'd sign on to, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think some of the conversation in, around all of these issues gets way too focused on one single answer, you know. so. Because certainly, um, you know, a year or two ago, I, I was uh, nominated for bishop in the Lutheran Church. Went through that process, and after I, after I came in third, uh, to 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 two excellent female uh, nominees, um, and uh, I feel great about what I did and what I said. Um, but I had some men uh, emailing me uh, when I was in Europe and wanting not to email anybody uh, with anybody. <laughs> um, their sense of loss that a white male was no longer the bishop of the Northwest Washington Synod. And what I had to say to them over and over again is that, is that a loss of privilege is not the same thing as oppression. <laughs> and so, and I didn't always say it that, that directly because I, I try to be a kind person sometimes, but there are many forces at work, including the historic, you know, racial bigotry uh, in, you know, that, that is in this country, the institutional and structural racism, Going, you know, all the way back to, you know, the, the dehumanization of of our Jewish neighbors uh, that goes way, 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 way back in, 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 the, in the history of Western civilization and is in many respects like the, the, the canary in the coal mine for how we're going to dehumanize people, right? So there's a lot of different factors to talk about one of them is not to deny that there's it's a very complex thing and that there's lots of factors we don't even we're not even aware of. Let's say more broadly, I mean, just we, we tend to reduce uh, there's so much reductionism to everything as a binary or as a dichotomy or polar opposites. And obviously, the most important issues of our day, there are many, many shades of gray and nuances. And unfortunately, and this is another product of social media, you know, our kind of worldview and our attention span has winnowed down so much that we don't entertain the nuances and complexities in ways that, if we ever did, the ways that we used to. <laughs> well, and it is a more complex world as well. And I think, you know, I, I've talked to quite a few, you know, sort of Trump supporters over time. I'll go back, when, back in, the, in the before days, you know, I'd sit in a coffee shop with my collar, you know, on and just doing some emails on the way to an event and, and people would walk up and talk to me. And I had this, you know, one particular conversation with a gentleman who, you know, who, when it boiled down to it after two hours of conversation, which was a little longer than I wanted it to go, <laughs> um, didn't get my work done that day, at least the work I'd planned. But when it really boiled right down to it, he was missing being younger. 
it was he was missing his experience he was nostalgic you know for the for for when he was young and it was a, a, his lack of capacity to recognize the impact of aging um, and to deal with his own mortality at the end at, at the root of it and i think about the the hebrew tradition which is which says that as as the created world is created god said it is very good so the life that you have with uh, its vulnerability and mortality is good. Uh, and and then I one time I was I was uh, speaking to a, a professor who I've read all his books and respected like crazy and and my friend sort of set me up you know and said well Terry you should tell Professor Hall what you think the Christian creeds you know are all about which was a terrible position right then I was almost tongue tied but I said. What the creeds are trying to say is that if being human is good enough for God in Jesus, it's good enough for us. That's what it's trying to say at root. And uh, and he said, yay, verily, in one of the greatest moments of my life, right? Yeah, you 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 have that element theologically. I don't have that element quite, but but they, but but there are other ways. There are other ways for me to get around that. So yeah, I I, I understand. I'm not I'm not <laughs> trying to impose that on you. No, no, no. I know, I know, I know. But that life is good, right? And that even life as as we age is good. And, and what was missing for this guy was any sense of that, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, that's all wrapped up in kind of hangups about death and focus on youth. You know, that's, yeah. uh, again, I'm a product of the consumerist culture you've been talking about. Yeah. You know, one of the um, the most uh, um, controversial, but I think really wonderfully expressive reflections of that in scripture is Ecclesiastes, where, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, traditionally it's ascribed to Solomon at the end of his life. But the notion of looking back on everything and really beginning to prioritize what's most important, you know, and if, if <laughs> the idea is if a person like uh, Solomon, who experienced everything at the most extreme level, you know, take his word for it as to what's yeah. what should be most important. And I think that's that's a text that needs to be studied more because I think it not only is about kind of gauging priorities, but it's also about understanding and appreciating um, the uh, uh, our span of years, you know, our four score plus whatever years that we have or less than that probably but but our score of i forget that the, i always mix up lincoln with uh with proverbs <laughs> but um but our you know x score of years that we have and that we should be you know happy and faithful and and again as the rabbis say you know who is rich it's someone who is satisfied with their portion and that portion is not just material resource it's also our portion of of length of years on earth indeed yeah yeah, and, and that and that gets back, you know, to the part first part of the conversation in some ways about about the value of a of a meaning system um, and and finding meaning in something in something that is a bit larger than just ourselves. Um, no matter what is happening in the larger culture around us, no matter what our 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 condition is at the moment, and and recognizing that this moment, this day, is good. And that part of our responsibility is to help, you know, as as uh, Genesis chapter twelve, you know, inspires, is that um, God's key value is to be a blessing to all the nations, families, and cultures of the world. That that is in fact part of our meaning. And that's how I try to 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 get at some of the the Christian tribalism and exclusivism isn't to say, oh, we, well, we should set aside Christianity. I try to take them back to the roots of the Abrahamic tradition uh, and, 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 and explore that uh, and explore Jesus as a leader within the Abrahamic tradition, not someone who is trying to start, you know, a, a new fast food chain with religious services, right? We'll leave that Paul was the Ray Kroc of Christianity, right? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, and the way, and, and even the way he, he gets interpreted is just crazy too, because know, he I was know. operating inside of a cultural environment, you know, every bit as complicated as our own. And, and so we read him like we, we just Im import him into our own c context and boy, there's a lot of damage there. A lot of damage there. Well, Danny, I just so appreciate you and, and the work that you do and the leadership you do in, in, in our community. Um, 
And I, I, I'm still very deeply appreciative uh, that I'm able to work for an organization that was really the, 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 the brainchild and the, the heart child of Rabbi Levine and, and who, who just, who saw the dehumanization of Roman Catholics in the 1960s during the election of John F. Kennedy and knew that he had to do something about that because he himself had experienced it as a kid and, um, and his tradition taught him that, that, you know, we cannot stand if we don't stand together. And so I'm appreciative for, for him and for Temple to Hirsch and for you and you're continuing that, that tradition. I look forward to conversations real soon. Me too. Listen, I am honored to be Rabbi Levine's successor, and I am just so appreciative of all of your work building upon his and Father Tracy's legacy and look forward to future conversations. Yeah, well, we don't know what we're doing, but we're going to keep trying, right? That's all we can do. So again, thank you to, to Danny Weiner for joining us today. And um, you can uh, you can find out more on their website about all, all the work that they're doing, uh, both as a community and within the larger uh, community. Um, thanks again for joining us for the Paths to Understanding podcast and, and uh, sharing some wisdom from our neighborhood with us. You can find out more at pathstounderstanding.org. You can listen to this and other podcasts on most major podcasting services. You can watch it on our YouTube channel. And until we see you again, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you.